I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, Italy after Berlusconi. What now for one of the world's biggest media barons? The Yemeni reporter who also works for the president. Which one is his day job? The media in Germany and their depiction of Turkish Germans. It's a problem. Bombenbauer in Nachbar's garage, wie gefährlich sind die Glaubenskrieger? And hooray for Kitty Wood, our web video of the week. The script was pretty light, so we brought in some cat bite choreographers to work out the action. No animals harmed. In the end, the Eurozone's debt crunch did what a series of parliamentary crises and a slew of sex scandals could not do. It brought down Italy's Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi. He resigned November 12th. However, Berlusconi still wields more influence than just about anyone else in Italy because of his vast media holdings. He controls one half of the country's terrestrial TV market through the three channels he owns. And his company, Media Set, is also a big player in the print and advertising sectors. For Italians who frequently took to the streets to protest against Berlusconi's media monopoly, the question now becomes, what are the chances that the country's laws will be reformed to prevent one man from ever having such a stranglehold over Italy's media again? The answer, at least in the short term, is the chances aren't great. Our starting point this week is the Italian capital, the fall of a political leader, and the future prospects of his Roman media empire. E la notizia è arrivata proprio. Berlusconi si è, è dimesso. Sentiamo allora in audio le contestazioni alla notizia ufficiale che Berlusconi si è dimesso. It was fitting and perhaps inevitable that Italy and its media problem would be illustrated so clearly on the very day Silvio Berlusconi left the Prime Minister's office. When Berlusconi resigned, there was a crowd of maybe 1,000 people around the Quirinale Palace where the president is, and they were chanting, they were jumping with joy, they were opening champagne bottles, this is the end of an era. And this was presented by the channels controlled by Berlusconi as a violent, threatening show against the Prime Minister and something that was demeaning of a public personality like him and that he didn't deserve at all. And to underline that, the chief editor of Rai One, the most watched government-funded channel who was appointed by Berlusconi, came to his boss's defense. Francamente, le manifestazioni di ieri che hanno salutato le dimissioni di Silvio Berlusconi come una festa di liberazione, non fosse altro per i toni, non posso che considerarle riprovevoli. Silvio Berlusconi has not been shy about imposing his will over state-funded channels Rai 1 and Rai 2. Nine years ago, he accused three of his on-air critics of making what he called criminal use of the channels. All three of them were dropped. Even without Rai under his command, Berlusconi still owns three other channels. It is a, indeed a really interesting question to ask, what happens now? Has his grip on the rice stations that he did control been loosened? And on the other hand, the channels that he does own, how will they fare when he's no longer also in control of key regulatory decisions which impact on those channels? That would be up to the new government, led by Prime Minister Mario Monti, or is it? Berlusconi uh, explicitly stated that he's going to be able to pull the plug, as it were, on this new government anytime he likes by withdrawing the support of his own party. And this places a constant blackmail on the action of the government itself. Should uh, Monti try to go anywhere near endangering Berlusconi's media monopoly or, for that matter, uh, uh, his own uh, economic interests, uh, Berlusconi is very clearly going to ask his party to withdraw support and precipitating a, a political crisis uh, in Italy. Maybe if after the election the centre-left wins, uh, and with a wide majority, they will try to pass a law uh, on conflict of interest. It is true that Berlusconi is the only one in Italy who has so, such a huge power. It's difficult to foresee someone else like him in the future. But I, I think it has been a good lesson and uh, it's possible that uh, the parliament will, will try to pass a, such a law. 
is going to be on the agenda. It's not going to be on the immediate agenda of this next government because they've got to deal with the euro crisis. But I think at some point there will be um, an attempt to try to prevent the sort of grip on the media that Berlusconi established ever being established again. The problem with uh, new legislation in this area is that once you've let a media company grow to this size, it's very difficult to introduce new legislation which will result in an obligation to break up these media companies or divest in some way. So I think it's probably more likely you'll have new obligations on the broadcasters uh, to be impartial rather than breaking up of the media, media company itself. But why would Berlusconi go along with that? Why own all those media companies if they don't buy you influence? The other potential player in all of this is Brussels. The European Union sets high standards for countries applying to be new members, higher than they ask of existing members or even founding members like Italy. If a country, let's say Turkey, for instance, uh, wants to be part of the EU now, you know, there are certain rules that you have to pass. Uh, you have to show that you're a democracy, that you have a pluralistic uh, information. And Italy would have been in trouble, probably. Probably they could have said something. But uh, there are no uh, clear mechanism in the EU to intervene against a member. Once you're in, it's harder to influence you. They can influence countries that are trying to applying to get in by saying we will only let you in if you liberalize your media. Since Italy is a member, it's hard for Brussels to exert much influence because traditionally they've allowed each country to decide its own media structure and to decide whether to intervene in, in media mergers. Um, so the role of Brussels is, is slightly diminished. That's the way EU member states want it. They argue that controlling their own media helps safeguard unique cultures and languages. But what is the point of having a modern political union that demands member states adhere to fiscal and economic requirements, but allows a founding state to have a media monopoly that looks like something out of a banana republic? This crisis is highlighting a very crucial dilemma that we have in the European Union. Uh, on the one hand, uh, supranational institutions are increasingly active in sanctioning national governments uh, when certain budget deficits are no longer respected. Uh, but when it comes to respect not so much of budget deficits, but, but, but of civil liberties and fundamental rights, European Union, Union authorities are proving totally incapable and in fact unwilling uh, to, to demand the exercise of fundamental freedoms uh, in, in the member states of the European Union such as the right to an open and pluralistic media, a balanced spectrum of information and ideologies. Italy does not have that. The media mogul has left office, but tonight, when millions of Italians tune in to one of his channels, commentators will not be burying Silvio Berlusconi, they will probably be praising him. And that, despite all his sexual indiscretions, all the criminal allegations, is the real scandal. Our Global Village Voice is now on the state of the media in Italy. Now that Berlusconi is out of power, his outrageous degree of control of the Italian media system might soon be a thing of the past. However, I'm quite pessimistic as to the future of Italian journalism. Italy is simply passing from the dominance of one media baron, Berlusconi, to the dominance of another media baron, the Australian Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch's satellite television, Sky Italia, might soon become this year already the biggest channel in Italy for revenues. And as we all know, Rupert Murdoch doesn't exactly have a reputation as a defender of pluralism and objectivity. I don't think in the next future anything will change in the media landscape in Italy. Uh, Berlusconi already said that, that he will not give his vote and he will not tell his party to vote for the new government if they will touch anything that has to do with telecommunication. Time now for listening post news bites. The message to Mexican social media activists could not be clearer. If you blog about the country's ongoing drug war, you'll pay for that with your life. The decapitated body of a man thought to be a blogger called Rasca Tripas was found in the Mexican border city of Nuevo Laredo on November 9th. It was the latest in a series of horrific warnings to Mexicans to stop using social media to report on the country's drug cartels. Next to the body was a note that read, This is what happened to me for failing to understand I should not report things on social media websites. Bloggers have been writing about the drug issue because they say mainstream media outlets in Mexico are now afraid to. 
Back in mid-September, the bodies of a man and a woman were strung up from a pedestrian overpass, again with a note saying that they'd been killed for their postings. Later that month, another body, headless, a moderator of a network called Nuevo Laredo En Vivo that allows users to find and swap information about drug cartels was found. A group of social media activists in Mexico has now released a Twitter manifesto that deplores the Mexican authorities' inability to stop the violence and demands that the government and international community do more to ensure the freedom of expression online. Last week, we reported on China and leading internet firms there agreeing to a government order to self-censor their services to curb the spread of rumors and information online, while well, Beijing's efforts at rumor control have not stopped there. New regulations have been imposed, banning journalists and media outlets from reporting on any story found online or disseminated on phone networks, unless that story is verified firsthand. Journalists will have to produce two sources for any critical reporting that they do. They're also required, when gathering news, to conduct interviews in person. If they fail to do so, they could be banned from working in the media for up to five years, and their publications could have their licenses revoked. Analysts say these measures are meant to counteract the advent of social media and micro-blogging websites like Sina Weibo, which is the Chinese version of Twitter. They've made it nearly impossible for the authorities to contain the spread of information online. It looks like the authorities in Iran have declared war on BBC's Persian language service. The latest casualty is a man named Hassan Fafi, who according to Iran's Fars News Agency was arrested after he appeared in a BBC Persian Live report, a report about an explosion at an ammunition depot. Fars accuses Mr. Fathi of secretly reporting for BBC Persia over an extended period and says he was arrested on charges of spreading lies about the Islamic Republic and manipulating Iranian public opinion. BBC Persia denies that, saying that Fathi is an independent commentator. According to the BBC, ever since it aired a documentary back in September about the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, there has been a dramatic increase in anti-BBC rhetoric coming out of Tehran. The BBC also says that 10 BBC Persia employees based in the UK are saying that their family members in Iran have been arrested. Often, the key to good political reporting is getting close to people in power. Some get a little too close. Case in point, Reuters' man in Yemen. A social media campaign on Facebook and Twitter has exposed what apparently has been common knowledge in Yemen for a while, that a Reuters stringer there, Mohammed Sudam, has also been moonlighting as President Saleh's personal translator. It's not like Sudam has been doing this on the down low. That's him in various presidential photo ops. Social media types have been having a field day with this. One commentator said, how lucky is Reuters' reporter in Yemen to get paid twice? once by Saleh for faking news and by Reuters for publishing it. The serious side to this story was reflected in complaints about Reuters' coverage. We contacted the news agency asking if they knew about this arrangement and how it squared with its editorial policy. Reuters told us that Mohammed Sudam has been with the agency for about 10 years. His contributions as a stringer are balanced and they meet the high standards we set. Then they changed their minds and announced that Sudam is no longer reporting for Reuters from Yemen. Last week, we reported on the state of the news media in Turkey. This week, a look at the kind of coverage Turks are getting in Germany. Fifty years ago last month, large numbers of Turkish guest workers started streaming into what was then West Germany to help with the country's labor shortage. Millions of them remain there today. Many Turkish Germans say they suffer from discrimination, some of which happens on television and in print. That was evident last year when a German politician wrote a book disparaging Turks and the impact that they've had on German society. The author was given loads of exposure on German media outlets and the book became a publishing and political phenomenon. The listening posts Flo Phillips now on stereotyping and discrimination the German media's depiction of the country's largest minority group. Die enorme Fruchtbarkeit der muslimischen Migranten eine eine der Bedrohung für die kulturelle und das zivilisatorische der Gleichgewicht im alternden Europa da. A year ago Tilo Sarazin's face was all over German TV screens. You can switch on the television without seeing him in 
some show. Dr. Tilo Sarrazin. Tilo Sarrazin. Es ist Tilo Sarrazin. The politician had just published Germany is destroying itself. It was a damning attack on the Turkish community. He says that um, Turkish uh, immigrants are dumber than uh, all, all the rest of the society. He claimed in his book that 80% of the Arabic and Turkish people in Berlin are useless. The media couldn't get enough of it, and Sarazin's work became the best-selling political book by a German author in a decade. The coverage was everywhere, but the tone was the same. The Turks are mostly shown as, as being backward to have a low ed education level. Some of our tabloids in, in Germany uh, try to make sensational reports about the problems of Turkish Arabic immigrants. Hello. And they like to do that because that seems to sell the newspaper better. And it's a story that's been selling for half a century. Und der hohe Anteil von Gastarbeiterkindern in den Ballungsgebieten. Fast jedes zweite Kind, das heute in Hannover eingeschult wurde, ist ein kleiner Ausländer. Back in October 1961, dozens of Turkish migrants boarded a train in Istanbul for a three-day journey to Munich. And here's a party arriving from Turkey. German post-war industry was booming and the country desperately needed manpower. Germans may not have expected the Turks to settle, but they did. And they've had a rough ride of it in the press ever since, even in the most mainstream of publications. Spiegel has had some covers uh, reporting about Islam and, and Turks in Germany, and they were all black. Like, uh, there was a mosque and uh, the background was completely black. Or there was a Quran uh, on the front and the background was completely black. Another cover, the picture of the um, Brandenburg Gate, which is really the symbol of Germany, and then the, the whole thing in darkness, and then with a half moon, and it said something like Mecca, Germany. Post 9-11, Turkophobia in the German media has grown worse. Mohammed Atta, one of the organizers behind the attacks, had worked out of Hamburg, and people began to blur the distinction between the Egyptian ringleader of 9-11 and the Turkish population. They are seen as alien, as dangerous sometimes, and since the 9th 11, the religion of these people become more and more important in the media representation. And it isn't just news coverage that's an issue. Leben diese beiden jungen, attraktiven Frauen völlig aneinander vorbei. Popular fictional programming, where a lot of Germans actually see Turks, tend to reinforce the stereotype. We have found that the media in Germany very often consciously or unconsciously uses certain stereotypes. Generally, you see them in roles as taxi drivers or in kebab shops, always in these lower featured parts. And the Turkish actors always have a Turkish accent or have deliberately incorporated speech disorders or something like that. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Tag? Können Sie sich ausweisen? Ausweisen? Aus Deutschland? We have a very popular crime series in Germany called The Tatort, when an episode takes place in an immigrant setting, Turkish or whatever, then you always get the same things that a woman is killed supposedly because of some honor issue within the family and always the people are shown as being backward. Never ever you get someone who speaks proper German, has a proper job and is like anyone else. Sometimes it's hard to judge whether the media fuel prejudice or prejudice fuels the media. Other times it's pretty clear, just as it was when a Turco-German law student was asked to audition for a reality TV show. They said, OK, you could be um, someone who's accused of, um, yeah, maybe robbery. And they said, OK, you could, you could do that. And could you please um, have an accent by, um, uh, when, when you're on uh, the show? We tried to interview two of Germany's broadcast regulatory bodies, 
Neither would talk to us. But two of Germany's biggest commercial networks, ZDF and ARD, had their output studied by an academic who says that one way to alter the message in the German media is to change the makeup of the people that work there. Migrants need to be empowered to make a difference in the coverage of Islam and, and Turks. They need to be empowered uh, to have room for participation within the media system. Since the German state does not play a very great role in, in German media policy, I think there is room and, and a real need for enhanced journalistic self-regulation and a new debate on the ethics of the image of Islam and the Turks in German media. If you just have Germans in the editorial rooms, if you just have Germans in front of the camera or behind the camera, um, then uh, I think that we can't see the real picture. There are a lot of successful Turks. Nazan Ekes. And I think that the media should really also focus on the, um, on the successful examples. But for Deutsch Turken, which is how German Turks are referred to, this story has been told this way for far too long. And for a country with Germany's relatively recent history, it's no wonder it's an issue. Sometimes you read an article and they're talking about Muslims, and you think if you would change the word into Jews, then this would not have been printed, definitely not. This is a country which has a specific history about racism. And so you can't tell someone he's racist uh, easily because that's a really big thing in Germany. And the more we can really openly, democratically talk about these things, the less uh, the reports will be unreal uh, and racist. Negative stereotyping of Turks in Germany has been going on 50 years. But Turkey's recent rise on the global stage is finally mixing things up. Maybe soon, Tilo Saracen will be eating his words. More Global Village voices now on the German media and their treatment of Turks. The German media discourse around Turks is mainly narrow and often stereotyped. Thus, the media is not mentioning the success of Turks as often as the integration debate or problems of Turks. And to avoid this misunderstanding and writing about the Turkish community in Germany, journalists have to investigate intensively and the media has to accept that prejudice deepens the gap between different cultures instead of building bridges. Turks are an easy target in Germany. With the book of Zarazin, Deutschland schafft sich ab, the debate has changed. Whereas years ago it was not acceptable to be intolerant or racist, it has become now more and more acceptable. And we do now in Germany have to come back to the basics and understand that those people we're talking about are humans. They cannot be reduced neither to a religious nor to a cultural identity. Finally, who knew when the World Wide Web was created that web surfers would end up spending so much time watching cat videos? Even people who don't like cats love cat videos. Most of the videos are homemade. They capture cats doing something stupid. Now here's a video that's not entirely serious, but if someone was to actually do this, take the web cat video to the next level, they'd probably make a ton of money. With more than half a million hits, Kittywood is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Well, I've been making cat videos basically, you know, my whole life. The first video that I uploaded to the internet uh, was in 1994. And that essentially started what we know as Kittywood Studios today. At any given time, cat videos make up about 30% of all internet traffic. We here at Kittywood Studios seek to capitalize on that by mass producing kitten and adult feline focused videos for the World Wide Web. But the beginning of that journey always starts in one of our writers' rooms. Here's the scene. Some kittens are playing on the kitchen counter. One of them slips, falls, into a trash can. Why are, why are they on the counter? What Oh, I wrote uh, Talking Cats. I co-wrote Cat Who Likes to Watch the Toilet Flush. This is the wall of fame. All of these videos have gotten over a million hits. Cat Ambush, like 20 million hits. The script was pretty light, so we brought in some cat fight choreographers to work out the action. No animals harmed. What you see here today is a gigantic kitty cat empire, but before it was all this, it was just the vision of one man.
Cat videos not only change the way that we look at cats and the way that we use our computers, but the way that we use our computers to look at cats. <laughs>